If you have your Bibles, take them and turn with me to the book of Romans. We're going to spend some time this morning in the book of Romans chapter 1. The book of Romans chapter 1. I want to read in your hearing two verses, although in the message we'll spend some more time in the rest of it, but Romans chapter 1. I want to read verses uh, 16 and 17. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. I'll be sharing from the New King James Version. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first, but also for the Gentiles. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by what? The just shall live by what? Faith. The just shall live by faith. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we stop to invite your spirit now to be present as though we know it's already been here. We just ask that it would continue and that it would fall in double measure upon us that we would see Jesus. As we talk about this glorious topic today, the one that gave so much hope and comfort to the reformers, men like Martin Luther and Calvin, we ask that you would give us that same comfort today. Make my preaching so thin in human wisdom that only Jesus might be seen. May we lift him up. May we be drawn to him. Forgive us of our sins. May we be covered by the righteousness of Christ. May we focus in now on your word we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So when we started our series, we... We started, I took you on a Reformation journey. We want to continue that Reformation journey. I want to take you back to um, where we left off last week and see if we can pick it up this week. And maybe it would help if I would get my remote to work here. Let's see. There we go. Go back to Germany. And what I thought I would do is I'd put a map up because sometimes we talk about these places We know where Germany is. It's over there in Europe somewhere, right? But where's Berlin in the map of Germany? There's the outline of Germany. Let's put Berlin up there. That's where we started our Reformation tour a couple of weeks ago when we began. And then we traveled just south, southwest to Wittenberg. And uh, and then from Wittenberg, we talked about Erfurt. And in Wittenberg, that's where Luther was doing his doctorate. He was a professor at the university there. He was a professor of theology. In 1517 in Wittenberg, he posted his 95 thesis on the castle church doors. Erfurt is where Luther was ordained as a priest some 10 years before. You'll remember how he was ordained. Do you remember me showing you the picture of the grave there at the front of the church, and he had to lay down and spread his arms across it? Do you remember that? The significance is, is that that grave is of the man who burned John Huss at the stake. And Huss prophesied and said, you will kill me, but from your ashes will rise a swan, one that you cannot kill. Isn't that interesting? And so that was um, uh, at Erfurt. Just a little ways away from Erfurt is where the Warburg Castle is. And for about 10 months, Luther was a resident of the Warburg Castle. You remember I showed you pictures of his study and the table where he did his work from. And so you can kind of see where all of these things are. And then there is where Worms is. Worms is actually just south of modern-day Frankfurt. Okay? So that kind of gives you a general overview of where everything was. And Worms is where Luther was put on trial, and they asked him if he would recant. And last week we ended the message with him standing there before the diet saying, Here I stand, I can do no other, so help me God. Remember that? So we want to pick up from there, and now I want to take you all the way to the southern tip of Germany today, just a few miles, literally just a 
uh, a stone's throw away from the Austrian border. Now, the story that I want to tell you today is not actually directly related to the Reformation, although I think as I share the story with you, you'll see the correlation and why I'm choosing to share the story with you. I want to take you to the southern tip of Germany and take you to the Neuschwanstein Castle. Oh, she's got the notes in her lap. She's cheating to see how to read it. Man. And then I thought, I'm going to take it off the slide so, I, so that uh, she has to just do it off the top of her head. Neuschwanstein. She's not worried. Neuschwanstein. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm just having fun. I really love that they're doing this and, and that you guys are here today. Neuschwanstein Castle. You may recognize that castle. Anybody been there in, in here this morning? Somebody been to the Neuschwanstein Castle? Do you re- oh, there is a couple of hands. Yeah, look at that, Rose. You've been there. Oh, and Judy, good. And uh, isn't, that, isn't that interesting? Judy and Rose, the only two hands I saw, and they were baptized two weeks ago. Oh, you okay. Heidi, good. I'm glad you, and Heidi, you just transferred in. That's wonderful. All of our new members have been to Neuschwanstein. This is cool. Neuschwanstein, you may recognize it because it is the, it is the castle that Walt Disney used to, to design his Cinderella castle. If you've ever been to Disneyland, the Sleeping Beauty castle is based on a replica of this of this castle and there's a picture that I took of it when I was there it was snowy it was cloudy it was a February morning when we got to the castle and uh, there's still snow is quite is quite cold uh, that morning and you know how it is you ask somebody when you take pictures they're nice and clear and you ask somebody to take a picture of you and uh, and then it gets all fuzzy and blurry you can't even hardly tell I'm in that picture and it's in high definition up there. But I was there. Here's a picture that I borrowed from Wikipedia and uh, got the license to be able to show um, the credit. This is the Neuschwanstein Castle from the other side. Isn't that thing amazing? I mean, this thing is phenomenal. And I want to talk a little bit about this castle that was built by King Ludwig II of Bavaria. He got his inspiration to build this castle after he had stayed at the Warburg Castle. Now do you see the connection? He was in the Warburg Castle, and the Warburg Castle has a hall for singers. It was where they liked to do operas and musicals and so forth. And Ludwig loved um, uh, Richard Wagner. And you know, Wagner was the, ni- um, the 19th century composer. He wrote operas and so forth. And Ludwig decided he was going to build his Neuschwanstein Castle as a ode to the the medieval times. He wanted to have a castle for himself, but he wanted to have a place where Wagner could conduct his his orchestras, his his operas, and so forth. And so this is the, the Neuschwanstein Castle, and you can see as you come up to it, this thing is immense. It's over 150 yards in length from front to back. It's over a football field and a half in size. According to the Wikipedia, uh, and uh, which is not reliable, but uh, always, you know. But I was on there trying to get a picture uh, that I could show you today, and uh, I found some interesting statistics. They began working on this castle September 5, 1869, and they worked on it for 23 years. How many years? 23. In the years 1879 and 1880 alone, just a year span that, that crossed over the new year there, Here are some statistics for that year of building alone. 513 tons of marble, 1,700 tons of sandstone, 400,000 bricks, and almost 2,700 cubic yards of wood that was used for scaffolding alone. That doesn't include the wood that they used inside the structure. That's in one year. Phenomenal. It was supposed to be ornate, it was opulent, and it was crazy. And as you walk through this castle, you just can't help but being floored at what you're seeing. Now, inside the castle, they don't let you use pictures. They don't let you take pictures. I had friends that were walking around with their iPhones, you know, click, 
click. And I just couldn't do that. I, I'm too litigious, I guess. And so I didn't take any pictures when I was inside. I bought postcards and I take pictures of the postcards, you know, so that I can have pictures. But um, I went into the public domain. I want to show you some pictures from the 1800s. These are fro- photochromes from the 19th century that have been digitized. And this is the bedroom chamber of Ludwig. I don't know if you can see this, but this is all woodwork here. Here's his bed here kind of to the left of center. All of that woodwork in there took four and a half years of carpentry to do. And uh, it's, uh, it's, I mean, it's just too much for the eye. It's just busy, crazy in there. And that's where, that was supposed to be his, his bedroom chamber. And then this is the Hall of Singers. Um, remember I told you there was a Hall of Singers at the Warburg Castle. And so this Hall of Singers here at Neuschwanstein is actually um, designed and replicated from the Hall of Singers at Warburg. And uh, it, it's just a phenomenal um, f- huge place and ornate. I don't know. If, I mean, when you walk in there, it just takes your breath away. It's, it's, you're looking at a digital image from the 1880s, okay? Can you imagine what it really, when you go in there and look at it? Here's the dining room. See how busy and ornate it is? It's just crazy. And then here's the throne room. The picture in this image is being taken from where the throne is, okay? You go up to the top of these marble stairs. This room is huge. It's like 43-foot high ceiling, hanging from the ceiling. You can't actually see it in this image. I'll show you another image. You'll be able to see it. There's a chandelier that hangs down from the ceiling, and it's 12 feet in diameter. I mean, this thing is a... That chandelier won't fit in most of our living rooms, right? Right? This thing is huge. It's just this monster of a behemoth of a thing. And this this throne room um, was was inspired by the Byzantine churches of the Middle Ages. In fact, there was a church in Munich that that, um, uh, Ludwig loved, and so he modeled his throne room after this church. Why would he do that? Because Ludwig saw that he was the king of Germany, Bavaria, by the grace of God. And he saw himself as the intercessor between God and man. Did you hear that? That's crazy. And so where there was a throne in the original designs, he had built an altar in the designs. And then when it came time to actually have that room finished, they took the altar out to replace it with his throne because now he will sit on the throne as a mediator for God. That's important. I'm going to show you why in just a little while, because the throne of God, he is replacing. Now, I'm going to show you another picture. This is off of a postcard. See, you're not allowed to take pictures. That's the throne. Do you see a throne there? Ludwig died before the throne could be completed. And when he died, the builder said, we're not finishing this, and they left the throne out. There is no throne in that palace to this day. It's not there, but that's where it's supposed to be. It's crazy, isn't it? Crazy opulence. It's missing a throne. Notice who's right above his head in the picture there. Can you see that? It's Jesus. You see? He's there between Jesus and his people. Neuschwanstein Castle is an interesting study of history and architecture and craftsmanship and economics And yes, even psychiatry, because Ludwig was declared to be insane. And that brings me to today's topic, sola fide, by faith alone. You see, by the time Martin Luther posted his 95 thesis on the walls of the castle church, Europe had been for more than a thousand years without a Bible in their language. The only way you got to know what the Bible said is when you heard the priest Read it at Mass if you understood the Latin. The Bible was not supposed to be allowed to be spoken in the common languages of the people, which is interesting because the Bible wasn't even written in Latin to begin with. When Paul sat down to write, he wrote in Greek. In not just any Greek, he wrote in what was known as Koine Greek, which was the Greek of the common people. Does that make sense? 
You ever heard of koinonia? Fellowship? Yeah, common fellowship. Koine Greek was the common fellowship language of the people. Hebrew was what the Old Testament was written in. Wasn't even written in Latin. And yet the church said all you can do is hear it in Latin. Why? Because we've decreed it. So Europe for a thousand years had been without its Bible. One bishop said it this way, God will not deny grace to anyone who, de- who does their best to follow God. That, th- this is, th- they didn't know whether to follow the Bible or not. There are people today who quote the Bible and they say, God helps those who help themselves. Have you ever heard that before? It's not biblical, by the way. In fact, it's not even Christ-like. It's not that God helps those who help themselves. It's that God gives us strength so that we can do all things through him. You see, there's a difference there. So Luther is reading his Bible, and he's studying this idea of righteousness, and he lived in a time when the church said, righteousness by works, you can only please God by the works that you do. We're talking about merits and credits that add up to more than your disobedience. In other words, every time you help the little old lady across the street, you get a merit point that keeps you one less day or one less week in purgatory. Are you with me this morning? You, you helped the man across the road mow his yard. You get a merit point one less week in purgatory. But oh, I lusted, so that point comes back out, and now I'm back in purgatory for another week. Are you following me? This is ridiculous. And so the only way you could get to heaven is if you had more good deeds than you had bad deeds. This was the prevailing theology of the middle-aged church. Are you with me? And Luther said, I hated it. This is what he said about it. He said, if, if, uh, if, if there was a monk, or say, let me, I'm sorry, let me say it different. I was a monk, good monk, and kept my order so strictly that I could say that if ever a monk could get to heaven through monastic discipline, I should have entered in. Luther's saying, if anybody deserved to get in, it was me. I did what I was supposed to. I did it better than anybody else. Doesn't that remind you of what Paul said? Paul said, I lived my Judaistic life better than anybody else. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees, he said. Righteousness by works. I can do all things by myself who gives myself strength, is that prevailing theology. And, and despite this, Luther has conflict. Listen to what he would write. He says, my conscience would not give me certainty. And I always doubted and said, you didn't do that right. You weren't contrite enough. You left that out of your confession. The more I tried to remedy an, 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 an uncertain, weak, and troubled conscience with human traditions, the more daily I found it more uncertain weaker and more troubled. The more I tried to do good, the more I found myself uncertain. Does that make sense? Listen, if you're trying to save yourself by what you're doing, if you're coming to church to find righteousness in Christ, you're wasting your time. You're not going to find it. God does not reward people who try to save themselves. Salvation is through Christ alone. You may remember the story of Luther climbing the the staircase on his knees, praying. The staircase that he climbed was called the Sancta Scala. It's 28 steps of marble, white marble. Now, the, the, the tradition, the, the theory of the steps, you know, the, the medieval church was full of relics. In fact, the, the Roman church today is even full of relics. Relics are things that the church has considered to be well, like, for example, there is somebody in Europe who a couple of years ago tried to sell a small splinter claiming that it was from the cross that Jesus died on. And the Roman church certified it as such. Okay? Does that make sense? The stairs, the Sancta Scala, are the 28 stairs according to tradition, according to lore, that, uh, that Jesus had to climb when he was going into Pilate's courtroom. And so somebody in about 326 AD came along, ripped them out of Pilate's courtroom and took them to Rome and they put them in 
the sacred basilica there. Martin Luther goes to this because it had been taught that if you climbed the stairs on your knees, praying the Our Father, praying the Lord's Prayer, that you could reduce your amount of time in purgatory. It was prevailing theology in Martin Luther's day. By the way, it was prevailing theology as recently as the early part of the 20th century. Pope Pius the something. He was the seventh. Pope Pius the seventh in the 19th century said that if people would climb those stairs in a prescribed manner, they could reduce their in. They could gain an indulgence of nine years for every step. So in other words, nine years less of time in purgatory for every step you took. Now you do the math, folks. That's like 200 and, what is that, 200 and over 40 years that you can reduce off your time in purgatory. Most of us here aren't even going to live to be 100 you're going to have that many bad deeds that you're going to have to be in purgatory for that long, okay? And, and in the early uh, part of the, later part of the 19th, early part of the 20th century, a few other popes came along and said, yes, we will honor what Pope Pius VII said. If you will go up the stairs on your knees praying the Lord's Prayer, confessing your sins to God, and kissing each step where possibly Jesus walked as he was on his way to trial, then you can take nine years out of your purgatory sentence per step. And so Luther went up those stairs on his knees, all 28 of them. And when he got to the top, what did he feel? He tells us, he said, when by the spirit I understood these words, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm gonna go back because he does, he does say it, but I don't have it on the screen. Um, he, said, he said this, he got to the top he shook his head, he couldn't suppress his doubt, and he said, who knows if any of this is true? So Luther gets back to Wittenberg, and he opens up his Bible, and he's studying the book of Romans. Hopefully your Bible is open. Romans chapter 1, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. If, the, if we're not going to be ashamed of the gospel, there's got to be something more to the gospel than having to climb stairs praying on our knees. Are you with me? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to what? To salvation for everyone who what? Believes. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as written, the just shall live by faith. And Luther's reading this, and he comes to that last little phrase, the just shall live by faith. And I, I just imagine him as he's reading that and he's pondering these two verses. Martin Luther was probably about five foot two, maybe five foot three at the most. This short in stature, but tall in spiritual maturity man is reading. He says, the just shall live by faith. I see the good dude jumping up out of his chair saying, amen, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Because suddenly he's realizing that something is better. This is what he said. Here's the what I almost put up there. When by the Spirit of God I understood these words, the just shall live by faith, then I felt born again like a new man. I entered through the open doors into the very paradise of God. That's so cool. So what brought this understanding to Luther? What was the understanding that brought, brought him so much peace? What is it about this text that got his spiritual juices going so that he was excited once again in Christ. It's those words, the just shall live by faith. And believe it or not, those words are not, are, they're being quoted here in Romans chapter one. The apostle Paul is quoting, I'm gonna take you to the book of Habakkuk. Don't look it up, it'll take you a while if you're not familiar with where it is. I'll put it on the screen for you. Here it is, Habakkuk chapter two, verse four. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but what? The just shall live by faith. What's going on here in Habakkuk chapter 2? Habakkuk chapter 2 is, um, is God pronouncing judgments against Babylon. You remember Babylon, and this is right before the Babylonian captivity. This is right before Daniel and his three friends get carried out of Jerusalem and off to, to Babylon. Are you with me? 
This is, um, this is as Nebuchadnezzar is coming to power, and Habakkuk is prophesying, and he's prophesying against the greedy and the arrogant and the ruthless, killing ways of the Babylonians. And, and he uses these six, six words as a great summary of the biblical doctrine of the righteousness by faith. The just shall live by faith. And I don't want you to miss the symbolism here. Remember your prophetic studies for just a moment. Babylon, ancient Babylon, murderous, ruthless Babylon, was just about to take Israel into captivity. And God had prophesied that Babylon was going to hold Israel captive for 70 years. Are you with me? You remember your studies? And, and, so, and so they're getting ready to go in, and God gives to Habakkuk these six words, and he contrasts the living faithful of Judah with Babylon. You see, even though there were people being carted away into, into captivity because of their idolatry, not everyone in Israel had fallen into sin. Are you with me? Daniel and his three friends, for example. They had remained faithful to the true God. And so, and so you have here God showing Habakkuk that the just are going to live by faith against the picture of of the Babylonians coming in and taking over and forcing them to do everything that they don't want to do. Contrast that symbolism of ancient Babylon with the medieval church, which Revelation calls Babylon. Are you with me? Now think about this for just a minute. Because what happens is, is Revelation uses the concept of Babylon in describing an apostate church. The medieval church was ruthless to those who disagreed. She was self-sufficient. She taught that salvation could only come through her. She taught that you had to do what she said if you wanted to be saved. Are you following me? And then Luther, in the Middle Ages, he reads this text in Romans that's a quote of Habakkuk, and he sees that the just shall live by And it's a parallel for us today. Because what do we do when bad guys come into church and start shooting the place up? See, that's, now it's getting close to home. The, the, the just, we live by faith. It's why we come to worship without a sidearm because our hope is in Jesus. Amen? Our hope, our confidence is in Christ. The just shall live by faith. What do you do when there are dictators in power and there's the threat of nuclear war? The Bible says that the just live by faith. What do you do when you're praying for answers but heaven seems to be silent? The just live by faith. What do you do when your dreams are suddenly turned to ashes? The just live by faith. To understand this better, in the final few moments that we have together, I want to give you five points as to why sola fide, righteousness by faith, is so important. Five quick points. Point number one is that justification comes from God alone. The just live by faith. Justification, we are justified by Christ, by God alone. In fact, if you look at verse 17 in your text, the Bible says, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed that the just shall live by faith. The word righteousness there is the same word as the word just in Greek. Righteousness and just. In other words, if you are right, you can have the righteousness of Christ given to you. That's how you are justified. Does that make sense? Righteousness and justified are the same word. The word righteous or just comes from the courtroom idea of the ancient world. You see, our courtrooms today are messed up. If you do not have, if they don't have enough evidence to convict you, do they say that you're innocent? No, they don't. What do they say? You say, no, you're, you're, you're not innocent, but you're not guilty. You may be as innocent as the day is long, but the court doesn't care. The court says, no, we're not going to call you innocent. We're going to say that you're not guilty. We're not saying that you did it, or we're not saying that you didn't do it, but we're just saying we don't have enough evidence to say that you did it. In the ancient Hebrew world, when God gave pardons, 
He said it was as though you had never done it in the first place. You were innocent of the charges against you. In other words, there were no need to bring charges against you. Do you see how powerful this is? When Jesus justifies you, he puts himself in your place so that the charges against you are now against him and his righteousness covers you. Our justification comes from God alone so that in Christ we are not only declared not guilty, we are declared innocent of all charges. I love... I love that God declares us completely innocent. In fact, I love this. The devil, uh, Martin Luther would say, when the devil throws our sins up to us and declares that we deserve death and hell, we should speak to him and say, yep, we do deserve it. What of it? We're covered by Christ. I'm paraphrasing, but that's almost exactly what he said. He said what of it, he says. I'm, I'm justified by Christ. I love it. Point number two. If I can get my remote here. Justification is by the grace of God alone. Justification is by the grace of God alone. If you'll turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 3, look at verse 23, and then we're going to go to verse 24. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. This is God's righteousness through faith. Look at this. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. How many have sinned? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But being justified freely by his, what? Grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Romans 3.24 says that we are justified freely by his, what? His grace. Justification starts with grace. You see, you understand that grace is not something you can pay for, right? Grace is undeserved merit. You don't deserve it. You can't earn it. You can't do anything to get it. It's when God decides to just give it to you because he wants to. Because look, you and I can never be good enough to measure up to God. Suppose I invite you to come to my house next Sunday because I'm going to make you my scrambled eggs and homemade biscuits and gravy. Any takers? You're like, wait, are you cooking? Hope you can cook better than you preach, preacher. (laughs) So I invite you to come over to my house, and I'm making you my famous scrambled eggs, homemade biscuits, and gravy. And uh, you're sitting there in my living room, and I'm across the way in the kitchen, and I'm cracking my eggs into the to the bowl that I'm going to whip them up in, and all of a sudden I crack the first egg, and this putrid smell fills the room. What's going on? It's a bad egg, right? And, and you say, what is that smell? And I say, oh, it's just an egg, but don't worry about it. I got a couple more here. That'll cover up the bad one. How many of you want to eat those eggs? No, I wouldn't either. Because the fact of the matter is, is just because you add more good to the bad doesn't make the bad good. Righteousness comes by grace. You can't do anything to fix it. You can't do anything to make it better. Good deeds don't cancel out bad deeds. Grace is grace. And without it, without grace, we have nothing. Does that make sense? We are saved by the righteousness of Christ. Point number three, justification is always based on Christ's death. Justification is always based on Christ's death. Look at verse 25. Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood. He's talking about Jesus, okay? We just finished verse 24 talking about Jesus. God set forth Jesus as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Let me just stop right there. The Bible says that God set Jesus forth as a propitiation. What's a propitiation? If you read history, you find some interesting things. The word propitiation is a Greek word that is a transliteration of an old Hebrew word. And the old Hebrew word is the word that was used to describe the lid on the Ark of the Covenant. 
I know one person got it. I heard him go, hmm. Think about this. The Ark of the Covenant was known as the mercy seat. It was in the Holy of the Holies. It was where the presence of God was. And on once a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go in to the Holy of Holies to make atonement for the people of the Israel. Are you with me? What the Bible writer is telling us, what Paul is telling us, just by using this word, the, the imagination of the, of the Israelite hearer would hear him use this word, propitiation. What he's saying is, Jesus is the mercy seat. He is the one that covers you. He covers you with his presence. He covers your sins on the merits of his righteousness and hands it over to you. In other words, that sacred Ark of the Covenant that no man was to see, no man was to touch, you remember? Couldn't even touch the way it was done. Only the priests and Levites, they had specific instructions on how to handle it. Why? Because it was a representation of Christ himself. And Paul says here that God has set Jesus as our mercy seat, as our covering, as our propitiation to give us atonement. There you go, pastor, using big words again. Propitiation, atonement. They're the same word. Because through the mercy seat of Christ, through his covering, we can have at one meant with Christ. And so, justification is always based on Christ's death. Point number four. Justification is based on faith, but affects the Christian's behavior. Oh, you don't like that one now, do you? Justification is based on faith, but should change the Christian's behavior. You see, this is where the rest of the world misunderstands the concept of justification, so we have to be careful. But let me see if I can explain it this way. There is nothing that you can do that will save you. Amen? If Jesus doesn't come and take us to heaven, we will all die. We only find life in Christ. We only find salvation in in Christ. Amen? Okay. So, now, here's, here's where, and, and, and we need to keep reading. If we were to keep reading the text, and let me just put it on the screen, verse 28 here in Romans 3, it says, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. The law says that everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6 says the wages of sin is death. So the law says that if you sin, you have died. Are you with me? Or you will die. Not that you have, you will. Are you with me? Okay. So, so here, what the Bible is telling us is, is that God saves not based on whether you're a Jew or a Greek, whether you're a male or a female. God saves based on the merits of Christ's righteousness. But when we're saved, something happens inside us. God saves you because he can and he wants to. It's called grace. Let me illustrate salvation another way. My wife and I got married. It'll be 19 years in January. Hard to believe. 19 years. And um, we stood there at the altar, and we professed our love for each other. And let's just say that after we had been married for five years, um, I never said I love you to my wife. For five years, I never told her I loved her. And then, and then after a while, she comes to me, and she says, Baby, do you, do you, do you still love me? And I answer, Well, I told you when we got married... Do you think that would work? I used to joke with my wife, baby, I love you, and if anything changes, I'll let you know. <laughs> uh, ladies, that would never fly, would it? Men, you know that wouldn't fly with your, with your wives. Yeah. And so, and so she comes to me and she says, how do you love me? Because I haven't said nothing for five years. I haven't demonstrated my love or my affection for her for five years. Can you imagine much less after 19 years? Or let's change the illustration just a little bit. Let's say that I come home every day and I tell her that I love her. But then after work, when I leave the office here, I stop 
down here, there's a bar just down the road. I won't call it by name, but you know what I'm talking about. And I stop in there, not to drink, because I don't drink, but I stop in there to make friends with the ladies. How many of you would believe that I loved my wife then? You don't, do you? Because you see, brothers and sisters, when you say that you love someone, your behavior around and toward that person changes. Therefore, I would submit to you that when we, dec- we declare to the world that we love God, our behavior about God should change. I'm not saved because of my behavior. My behavior becomes a de- demonstration of my salvation. And that's where the world's got it all backwards. People say, oh, you're doing work so that you can be saved. No, I'm doing works because I got saved. I don't come to church this morning so I can be saved. That is an effort of futility. I came to church today because I am saved, and I'm saying so. I'm letting the world know that God has done something in me and through me and for me. So I think God would like to have us say to him, God, I love you. And just like we would never say I love you to our spouse and then not act like it, I think God wants us to say that we love him and then act like it. Amen? And so salvation is justification. And justification is when we say, it's like it's a declaration of holiness. It's like God says, okay, because of Jesus, this one is mine. This one is saved. You are saved in Christ at that moment. Oh, brothers, that's good news. Should be jumping up out of your seats, hooping and hollering, saying, Lord, thank you, Jesus. You see, when we understand that we're justified and our behavior changes, it becomes that, that, that we're not legalists. It becomes that, that, that we don't keep the commandments to be saved. We keep the commandments because we are saved. We, our behavior tells others what we believe. Our church attendance tells people that God is important to us. It's like we're having a date with Jesus, amen? My, my Sabbath attendance on, is, is a statement that I believe that the Bible is true. My tithing is a statement that I trust God because Lord knows I can't make it on what I make. And then to give 10% of it to God, it's a statement of faith. My diet and my avoidance of harmful substances says that I want to honor God. It's not legalism, it's love. Now, some can take it to legalism, and those who do are now doing it for works for salvation, and that will get them lost. Are you following me? And this really gets to the heart of what the the Reformers taught, another word, sanctification. You see, sanctification is the process of becoming holier. That's the process of becoming more Christ-like. If justification is the act of a moment, sanctification is the act and the process of a lifetime. In the moment I came to Jesus, in the moment that, Cindy, you were baptized, you were new in Jesus. Unfortunately, I've got some bad news. You are going to sin again. I wish I could tell you it was different. But before I got to church this morning, I probably committed a sin and didn't even know it. I'm a human, and humans are fallen. There is no righteousness in us. We are going to sin. So I was justified. I came to Christ. Sanctification is the process of becoming more and more like Jesus. When I realize that cheating on my wife is a bad thing, I stop it. Let me put it into spiritual language. When I realize that sinning on God is a bad thing, I stop it. I come to Jesus and I say, okay. And there may be somebody here dealing with pornography. Okay, God, I need you to take this away from me because I know it's wrong. And so God takes it from me. That's the process of sanctification. And then you say, oh, I want to give up weed and marijuana. God takes it from you. That's the process of sanctification. You understand what I'm saying? It's not that you become perfect. It's that you become better than you were. Because nobody will be made perfect until the day when Jesus comes and he gives us the final cation, glorification. The completion 
of holiness. This is what the early reformers believed, that justification was the work of God in the moment to declare that you are saved. Sanctification was the process of holiness where you become more like Jesus. And glorification is when Jesus makes it all real at the end and takes us home with him. Now, isn't that beautiful? But look, brothers and sisters, I want to submit to you that, that, that this is the reason why people in the world can tell you, oh yeah, I got saved April 19, 1986. April 19, 1986. That was the day I got baptized. 30 years ago, 31 years ago. That was the day my dad took me in a baptistry, not too much different than that one and let me pro publicly profess my faith. But if you were to ask me, Pastor Ben, when did you get saved? I'm not gonna tell you April 19, 1986. No, I won't tell you that. I'm gonna tell you November 11, 2017. And if you ask me tomorrow, I'm gonna tell you November 12, 2017. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because justification happens every single day. I get up every morning and I say, God, I need you to justify me one more time today because I'm not good enough. And you know what? Sanctification is not just the work of a lifetime, but it's also the work of a moment. Because in that moment that you are baptized, in that moment that you are, you are recreated in Christ, you are a new creature. In that moment, you are set aside for holiness, use of God. Justification, sanctification, and glorification. Does that make sense? This is what the reformers taught. And this is so key because it goes against everything else that the rest of the world believes. It's why Tony Palmer, I showed you a couple of weeks ago, could stand up and say the, the protest is over because the world does not understand these three simple concepts. You don't go to church to be saved. If you're going to church to be saved, then you can count on it. You're going to be lost. You go to church because you are saved, because you're a child of Jesus, and you want to tell the world that you're his. Point number five. Justification is the heart of the everlasting gospel. The Bible makes it clear that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible makes it clear that from Genesis to Revelation, it is God chasing man to save him. That God is our Savior, that he is our Redeemer, and it's righteousness by faith. It's Christ's righteousness and our faith in him. It's the essence of the everlasting gospel. It is the entire sweep of salvation. It is the heart of redeeming grace. God loves you so much that he would send his only begotten son, that if you would just believe in him, you should not perish but have everlasting life. If that isn't righteousness by Christ, I don't know what else is. But you see, because this is so powerful, the Council of Trent had to fight this. Because what I just taught you flies in the face of indulgences. It flies in the face of purgatory. You cannot have indulgences in purgatory with what I just taught you. It's impossible. It's, it's completely contrary to the word of God. And so in the Counter-Reformation, the Roman church convened in the 15. 40s, 50s, and 60s, and they wrote, would write that through the observance of the commandments of God and of the church, observance of the commandments of the church, faith is cooperating with good works. Okay, you're not getting it. Justification is increased by obedience and good works. Okay, you're still not getting it. Let me put this into the language of Rome. G Rome teaches that when you come to Jesus, the moment that you are saved, you are fit for purgatory. Because when you are saved by Christ, you don't get to go to heaven. You have to earn your way to heaven you can call yourself a child, but until you got enough merits to get to heaven, buddy, don't, call, don't count on going to heaven. We'll tell you when you can go to heaven. 
Some of you don't even believe me. Some of you are laughing. You say, well, that's really funny. It's really serious. Look at this. This is from the Catholic Catechism. I have the book in my office on my shelf. I should have brought it out to show you. But this is what it says on page 47, paragraph 210. Since the initiative belongs to God in the order of grace, no one can merit the initial grace of forgiveness and justification. Stop right there. Notice those words in italics. No one can merit the initial grace. Those are not my italics. Those are the italics of the church. I'm not emphasizing it. They're emphasizing it. Put put that in the back of your mind. Listen. Since the initiative belongs to God in the order of grace, no one can merit the initial grace of forgiveness and justification at the beginning of uh, conversion. Moved by the Holy Spirit and by charity, we can then merit for ourselves and for others the graces needed for sanctification, for the increase of grace and charity, and for the attainment of eternal life. Go ahead and say, have mercy. Because, brothers and sisters, Jesus didn't die so we could go to purgatory. He died so we could live with him. Jesus didn't die so we could wonder if we're saved. First John chapter 5, verse 13, he says, My little children, I write these things to you so that you may know that you have eternal life. Jesus didn't die so you can wonder if you're saved or not. Jesus died so you can be saved and so you can know you can be saved, so you can have peace in his salvation, and it's yours for the asking. Some of you here may feel like you're not good enough. Let me help you out. You're not. I'm not either. I put on my dress clothes every Sabbath and I come in here, but let me tell you, on the inside, there is a wretched man who cries for the grace of Christ to cover him every single day. No, I'm not good enough. And baptism isn't the end, it's just the beginning. We have the whole rest of our lives ahead of us to try and to struggle, and unfortunately, we're gonna fail. That's where God's grace comes in unmerited favor, his righteousness, not ours. So you need to come to Jesus wherever you are. Jesus is coming, and we need to be ready to meet him. So the best way to get ready to meet him is to come to him. I see the clock. I'm almost done. Let me finish where I started. castle was expensive. It was built with the idea that we could work our way to heaven. Just about broke the Bavarian king. In fact, he was trying to get loans in places he couldn't get loans anymore to finish it. The original estimate was that it would take three years to build this castle, but because of renovations and extensive changes, After 23 years, they were still working on it. It's estimated today that the cost of the project in his day would have been about $38 million. If you wanted to build that castle and completely finish it today, some have estimated that it would cost $600 million. You know what's crazy about it all? Only 14 of the rooms were completed before Ludwig died, out of over 200. Only 16 rooms or halls are finished today. The rest of the castle remains unfinished. There are sections of the castle they won't let you go in there, but it's just bricks and concrete. That's all it is. After Ludwig died, they turned it into a museum. All that money, all that opulence, all those expenses, and the man ended up only spending 172 days living there. Today, men and women are building their castles. Their castles at work. Castles for home. Castles for church. They're building castles where they think they can go and retreat, and for what? You see, justification by faith isn't about what you can do or what you can build. It's about what Christ has already done for you. The only thing left is to believe in him. Run to the cross and turn away from your sins because it boils down to these six words that the entire Reformation was hinged on. The just shall live by faith. That's the message that we preach to the world. That's the text that changed the world. And this gem for the Reformation actually began 2,600 years ago 
with a prophet named Habakkuk. He started the Reformation. In our generation, let's finish it. So let me ask you, are you saved? Would you like to be? I'd like to take just an added moment and say thank you for joining us here on the online campus of the South Tacoma Adventist Fellowship. We at staff are thrilled to hear from viewers just like you from all over the world, and we're thrilled to have you join this growing ministry. If you have questions or comments or would like more information about today's topic, I invite you to take just an extra moment to go to our website. It's www.staffonline.org. There you'll find today's presentation as well as previously recorded presentations. You'll also find a contact form that you can use to get in contact with us here at staff. And there's a prayer request page that you can go to if you would like our ministry team to join with you in petitioning the Heavenly Father. That's www.staffonline.org. While you're there, we'd invite you to take a moment to consider partnering with us in this ministry. This ministry is made possible through the generosity of the members of the staff church as well as online viewers like yourself. We believe that Jesus is coming soon and we want to share this gospel with as many people in every way possible that we can before he comes. If you've been blessed today, would you consider being a ministry partner with us in sharing the gospel? You can do that simply by looking for the green link that says give at our website. Finally, I want to say once again, thank you so much for being a part of our time together today. And as we leave you, let me leave you with the words of Paul that he shared to the Thessalonian church. He says this, May our Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father who loved us and in his special favor gave us everlasting comfort and good hope. Comfort your hearts and give you strength in every good thing that you do and that you say. May the Lord's blessings be with you. We'll see you next time.